are going to sacrifice your shame, yourself, your pride and all. It occurred to me that Jesus Christ went through the same. It was not comfortable for him. It was painful for him. It was shameful for him. He went through fear. He went through every emotion you are going through. But the love of God was greater than all those emotions. And so, let me read for you something about Jesus so that you don't think that Jesus was going to the cross joyfully. No. Matthew chapter 26, verse 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Wait, don't, don't stop there. For some of you, you will go on this evangelism shaking, afraid and sad. It's like, is it by force? I wish I didn't give my life to Christ. But you'll be, you'll be miserable, but go in. Because that is, how Jesus, that is what Jesus did for you. That is what it took Jesus. Look at him going to the cross. I am sorrowful and deeply distressed. He began to be sorrowful. 38. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. This is on the way to get you salvation. So on your way to getting somebody's salvation, you're going to feel fear. You're going to feel discomfort. You're going to feel, I don't know, vulnerable and all. But you're going to go. Because at the end of the day, he died. And as a result of his death, we are seated here today. When you go afraid, you go confused, you go not knowing what to say. The Bible says you go out weeping. But how are you going to come back? We rejoice in doubtless bringing in the sheaves. Have you, have, you had, have you seen that in your Bible? So you go afraid, you go confused, but when you get the sheaves, you come back skipping. Because the devil is out there to make you afraid, but you will overcome. You will overcome. You will overcome. Because God is with you. He said, and lo, I am with you. Have you seen that in your Bible? So God is with us, and he will help you through it. Amen? I want, I'm drawing par, uh, parallels with Jesus to see that there is nothing you are going through that Jesus hasn't gone through for you. And like I said, he has gone through the harder part. The Bible says, for the joy that was before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. So Jesus was ashamed. At a point, they nakeded him. Is there a word like that? Yes, I just created it. They nakeded him. At a point, they put a crown of thorns. They spat on him. They did that to Jesus. They spat on him. You, saw, you see it during the, the Easter, the Passion of the Christ. So Jesus Christ went through everything, but look at what has happened to him. He has gained us. He has gained us. It, will it not be fantastic one day you stand and look in heaven and there are 1,000 people sitting. You went through discomfort and shame, but you took them to heaven. Can you imagine? Do you know what 1,000 people look like? It's like, I think maybe this hall now because the chairs are half. It's like everybody here in your name. Come on. Your reward will be amazing. Your reward will be amazing. And you know what? You can get a thousand people saved like that. It's just to get the first three, the first ten. After that, it will become a habit for you. By the way, the topic of my thing is make it a habit. Bishop Oedepo says, service to God begins in the heart. Our attitude to kingdom service is a mirror of our heart. So if you love God in your heart, it will show by outward evangelism. If you love God in your heart, it will show in your evangelism. It will show in your passion for souls. According to him, we can't have a heart for God and not give out all, and not give our all in service. And our all is bringing people to the kingdom and expanding his kingdom. So you either have a heart for God or a heart for mammon. There is no in between. And if you have a heart for God, it's no longer, I wrote here, it's no longer enough to be born again. It's no longer enough to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's no longer enough to just come to church and do all the right things we have taught you. The 16 things I said about loving God until you make soul winning a habit. So you will know you have reached the level of Christianity you are supposed to reach when you begin to evangelize, when you begin to bring people into the kingdom. When do we know a woman is really matured? When you give birth to that phase, we will say, now you are a woman. So when you begin to give birth to children in the kingdom, you have come. You have arrived. Up until then, you have not. So this is what I thought as I prayed and um, coined this message. That 
evangelism must become like coming to church. You know, we have made a habit of coming to church. We have made a, a habit of praying and reading our Bible. We have, nobody needs to talk to you about tithing anymore. True or false? Do I need to talk to you about singing and praising God? Eventually, evangelism must become a habit like that. Where you go every day, you will set your own timetable of either going every day or two times a week or three times a week or once a week and you will go every day. Eventually, it will become a habit. So until evangelism becomes like praying in tongues, like sitting in church, like um, giving to people, like breathing, you have not arrived. And that is where we are going. Amen? If I do this work of my own free will, then I have my pay, my reward. But if it is not of my own will, but done reluctantly and under compulsion, that's the New King James, I am still entrusted with a secret. In other words, God doesn't care whether you do it compulsively, whether you do it joyfully or not. You know how I used to tell you, bring your offering, whether you like it or not, whether you are crying, just bring it, I don't care. Whatever, just bring it. That is how God is with souls. Other things, he will let you go. Eh? Ah! Giving your offering, God said, you don't have to give it compulsory. If, you are, if it is compulsory, say, keep it. But with souls, you know what God says? It's still a trust. You can cry, oh, you can curse, oh, you can do what, oh, whether you finish and complain. Ah, ah, come, 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 come. You remember Jonah? He was complaining. God said, I don't care. The whole city is, if you like, cry. As far as God, God will collect the souls, whether you are crying or laughing. He won't say if you did it grudgingly, don't bring the soul. Bring it grudgingly. Curse and all, bring it. Some people are preaching cries of strife and cries of righteousness. Paul said, whether that cries of Christ, cries of crisis, cries of cursing, cries of... He said, at least the gospel is preached. <laughs> that shows you the seriousness of this matter, isn't it? That shows you the seriousness of this matter. That God will take a soul anyway. Just don't kill somebody in the name of trying to lead them to God. What does the ERV say? How does the ERV say that verse 17? ERV version of 1 Corinthians chapter. Everybody read it. It's interesting. New Living Translation. If I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve a pay or payment. But, if, but I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. This is not an assignment for a few of us. It's a command to all of us. So we must start right away. How do we start? How do we start bringing souls to people? I told you three weeks ago, so pray. Pray for yourself. Pray. And then join the other prayer things we are doing. Be in a group and pray. Pray, pray, pray. And then shift your mind to making this your most important Christian duty. So you know now that from now on, the only reason why you are alive is to win souls. The only reason why God is still allowing you to be alive is to win souls. You are not here to see your grandchildren or great-grandchildren. We should start praying a prayer and say, may God, rather than saying that, may God let you see your great-grandchildren. Say, may God let you see your great-grandchildren in the Lord. May God let you see your spiritual great-grandchildren. Let's start praying like that. Let's start speaking it because that is the most important thing. So we must have a mind shift to make this the greatest assignment on earth. Not your job, not your business, not your children, nothing. He who loves children, father and mother more than me, the Bible says, is not worthy of me. Praise the Lord. So number one, pray. Number two, shift your mind to making this your most important Christian duty. And this is how you express your love to God. Number three, start by telling some non-threatening people. This is what I, I mean. If you are a boss, start by telling your, your juniors. They are non-threatening. And for crying out loud, if, they are, if you are above them, they will receive Jesus Christ so that they will be in your good books. If I'm going to give you 10K... Because you have school fees to pay. And after that, I preach the gospel to you. I will do it. You say, Pastor, are you buying them? I say, I wish I had the money in the world. I will buy everybody up. Because by any means, I want you in heaven. So you start with the people that will not say no to you. And then you begin to get the joy. You begin to get the joy. So you start with them. You get them filled with the Holy Spirit. And they are all in your car. 
But then you go to the next group that is a little bit intimate, like your friends and all, and talk to them. So you begin from the easiest, get little, little victories, easy victories to the difficult ones. Because there are some people that Satan has decided to sit on their, in their hearts. Those ones you will need to, you know some demons don't come out except by what? <laughs> Literally, there are some people you are going to pray and fast before you talk to. But then there are some that by, by virtue of your position, you will get them saved easily. God, so sweep these easy ones into the kingdom first and then strategize on how to get the other ones. Is that okay? I'm teaching you very easy ways to get saved, to get people born again. Praise the Lord. And then um, I wrote here to keep progressing. Once you get the first, second, third into, it becomes easier. Share your testimony where you were and where you are, you are now. Tell them that you accepted Jesus Christ and he did this and did that for you. And then ask them to come to invite Jesus. Say, say this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Make, be my Lord, be my Savior. That's enough. And they say, you know what? I don't know much about the Bible. I'm still learning. But follow me to church and they will teach you the rest. Follow me to care group and they will, you will learn more. Follow me to church and I will take you to where they teach the Bible. Okay? I said you can get people saved by taking them to the care group and let your care group leader get them saved. You don't, you say, Pastor, I don't know what to say. Just invite the people. Take them to care group. And before you bring, say, care group, I'm bringing somebody. To, I don't know, you, you need Jesus. So, so between you and you people, sort yourselves out. That is, what, that is what Andrew did. I have seen the Messiah. Come, I will show you. He didn't say, come and accept. He just said, I've seen him come. So you take him there and leave him. So that's another way of evangelism. Just, and then another way of evangelism is bringing them to church. Don't say, well, just put the people in the car and bring them to church. It is our responsibility to get them saved. And pray that day that we do altar call. And if we don't, just tell them, did you enjoy church? They said, yes, tomorrow I'll, I'll bring you next Sunday. Just keep bringing them until the day we, we do altar call. But if you are worried, they may go back. You bring them to the front and say, Pastor, I brought this person. Please pray for him. We will do it. We are so anxious to do those kinds of things. Praise the Lord. Another way to get people saved is to take them to a believer, whether in your office or in your neighborhood. Take them to a Christian that you know can pray for them. In other words, you don't have to know anything. Just be willing to take the person to a, somebody that, that, can, that can talk to them. Amen? So take them to an older Christian. Bring them to church. Take them to care group. And then another way of evangelism is through church planting like we are doing right now. There are some people, to be honest with you, who will not have the time to be usher in church or to do anything in church. But God has blessed them with resources. But somehow, shall you try to use your mouth to at least take 10 people to heaven. If nobody, take your own family. But the purpose of money, if you see oodles and oodles of money in your life, is because God knew you were a giver. And he put the money and he said, I know... She will give it to the, for the gospel. He will give it for the gospel. Praise the Lord. So no matter what you do, even if you plant churches, and in the church planting, be a part of it. Be a part of the, of, of the leaders. Be there, but give your money. But like I wrote, wrote here, no matter what, still bring, be actively evangelizing because that is important. Please listen to me. Evangelism is not an event. It's not an event. It's not something you do and stop. It, because now, if we stop preaching now, you'll stop evangelizing. And, and see, that is what I, I said at the beginning, that you have to make it a habit. That way, whether we are preaching about it or not, you already know that this is your assignment. Because whether I preach about coming to church or not, or giving or not, you give your tithes and offerings, isn't it? You have made it a habit. Evangelism must be a habit. It's not something you start and stop or do once. It is something you do every day of your life. The last day you will stop evangelizing is on your deathbed. And even on your deathbed, people come to see you before you die. You say, have you accepted Jesus Christ? Repeat this prayer after, before. I'm not kidding. It is that serious. Is it not, was it not on Jesus' deathbed that he told the man, today you will be with me in paradise? He could have kept quiet and said, you know, I'm in trouble. Don't talk to me about heaven, right? I'm in pain. No, he said, today you will be with Come on, come on. Today, you, he was on his deathbed. Stand up, let's go home. I know I have preached real good. Somebody shout unto the Lord. So the day you stop preaching is on your deathbed. 
until Jesus paid the price on the cross and connected us to God, he couldn't say it was finished. The last... I mean, he healed the sick, he raised the dead and all. He didn't say it was finished. When it was finished was when he finished the work of connecting man to God. Your work is not finished until you can say, I have connected men to God. Amen? Let's clap unto the Lord.